Welcome to a Crest Advisory interview special and I'm delighted to say that I'm joined today by Neil Basu who very recently left the Metropolitan Police after 30 years service uh, in policing. Uh, Neil, thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure, Danny. Um, I wanted to start uh, by asking you about the state of policing at the moment. You have said quite recently that policing is in a crisis. That's a pretty strong description. I want to ask, why have you come to the view that you need to use that description for, for the state of policing? Well, I think anyone, unless you've been living in a cave, if you've opened a paper, switched on your radio, looked at a social media feed in the last two years, you will have seen that policing is in crisis. You don't need me to explain it. Crisis, though. I mean, the, you know, there are problems with policing. There is a lack of trust and confidence. There are legitimacy questions. But crisis suggests it's kind of on the edge of something that, you know, it's about to sort of, you know, be a calamity. You know how long I was in policing and how much I love it. It's a vocation. I still love it. If you cut me in half, I'd have Metropolitan Police Service written through me like a stick of rock. Um, but if I didn't know what I know about policing and I was looking to join policing today, I wouldn't. That is what I mean by crisis. That trust and confidence deficit that I have not seen in the place that it is now in my whole 30 years has been declining since 2017. So some of the debacles over the last... Um, two years, the murder of Sarah Everard by a serving police officer, the serial rapist who's just been convicted for 30 years. These things are monstrous incidents in time, hiding a wider problem in policing with trust and confidence. But it was declining before those incidents happened, largely around performance, largely around the fact that just like every other public service, it has suffered from austerity. And while it's suffered from those cuts of 20,000 cops and 20,000 members of staff, all of which were doing a job in 2010, our ability to actually do what the public wants us to do, which is to prevent and detect crime, has been severely stopped, basically. And then if you look on top of that, technology changed dramatically, fraud and cyber are you know, by far the vast majority of crime that affects the public today, but we barely touch the sides. If you look at environmental crime, if you look at the immigration crisis, if you look at the social changes in society, particularly mental health, particularly missing people, particularly the most vulnerable people in our society that have become policing's job to deal with. So much so that now, you know, 83% of the work we deal with is nothing to do with crime. That'll come as a shock to people who don't follow policing. Um, I happen to think it's incredibly important that we are much more than crime fighters. You know, talk about the social service of last resort. Um, I was very proud of that. Policing moaned like a drain in 92 when I joined about being the social service of last resort. I was incredibly proud of it. You know, the idea that you could help people at the worst time of their lives was something that we all, you know, we all write about it when we apply to join. Whether you mean it or not is really tested by the first time you're dealing with something that isn't crime. You know, it's an elderly person who needs your help, it's someone who needs your directions, it's a, someone in a mental health crisis you've got to get to hospital. I think policing needs to do that for trust and confidence, but it also needs to be effective at crime. It is neither of those things anymore and it has alienated large sections of the community, both women and girls, the black community who's had a problem with us since Windrush, and we have failed to address those problems. But when you talk about the importance of that mission, of that sort of more social side of the mission, isn't that one of the problems, is that that has sort of overtaken much of, of, of the policing sort of manpower, resource and so on, to the point at which they're spending too much time on non-policing activity. They, they, they're the service of last resort, and you, you, yeah. you, you, you're saying you want them to be there, but it's gone too far, hasn't it? Well, unfortunately, I don't disagree with the word you've just said, because I think what's happened is, over the last 30 years, and it is during my career, um, we've become the social service of first resort. I'm still saying we. You see how much I love my whole profession. Um, and being the social service of first resort is the problem. And that's happened because lots of other public services have crashed through austerity as well. So there aren't the mental health places, there aren't uh, the places in the medical community, there isn't the capacity or capability to deal with the kind of social problems that policing is normally first on scene for. And the most important thing to see policing as is part of a wider system. Sir Michael Barber talks about it brilliantly in his um, strategic policing review. You know, we should be a public safety system of which policing is a part. But being part of that system 
and Peel knew this, was about prevention. It wasn't about detection, it wasn't about arrest, it wasn't about use of force, it wasn't about conflict. It was, could you make society safe so that actually the absence of police officers would be a sign of great success, not a sign of failure like it's become. And now we're like a, you know, we're like a sticking plaster on a problem that society has created and has made more unsafe with lots of issues to deal with that policing is not trained and equipped to deal with, but is trained and equipped to stop it and then signpost it to people who can deal with it. There's just nobody left at the other end of the signpost and that is a really sad state of affairs. How, how does policing get itself out of this crisis then? Well, I mean, if you're a chief constable of a certain bent, you'd say, um, back to basics, we're only there for law enforcement, just do the crime fighting thing. You don't agree let with it? Let everyone else do Well, I don't agree with it for two reasons. I definitely agree that we should be effective crime fighters. I was, I'm incredibly proud to say I'm a police officer. I'm also incredibly proud to say that I spent the vast majority of my career as a detective. You know, the reason I joined was to put very bad people behind bars so they wouldn't be a threat to society, and I spent a very long time doing that. We need to be much better at that. We need to be able to do that effectively. That's part of our trust and confidence. So if that's what they mean by back to basics, I agree with that. But in order to do that, you need the public to help you. The idea that policing can do that on its own has never been true. So all of my cases required intelligence, crime scene management, public willing to help me, um, definitely informants, you know, effectively the public trusting policing to do its job. Now, where does it get that trust from? It didn't actually get it from specialist detectives like me or riot police officers charging into communities. It gets it from the day-to-day -day interaction it has with police officers who are trying to keep them safe, who are giving them a friendly ear. I used to call it smile and speak at Barnet. never took off. People, police officers are addicted to stop and search. Try smile and speak. And the effect it has on a member of the public when somebody in great authority with a uniform, usually large, usually intimidating, particularly these days, you can be the smallest police officer in the world once you've put armour on and uh, you know, a jacket and then fluorescence and then carry your 20 pounds of kit, you look enormous. That is very intimidating to the public. Try smiling and saying hello. And what difference that would make to our confidence. It sounds simple, it's about visibility. You can watch police officers walk around talking to themselves. You can watch them walking down high streets. They're not talking to the public. They're not looking at the public. They're not interested in the public. That is a massive mistake. When, when did that start to go wrong? That sort of smile and speak approach that, that you've outlined, the, neighbor, well, the neighbourhood policing model? I'm, I'm not for one second going to say this is 1950s Dixon of Dot Green and it was always like that. It was never like that. It got particularly worse when uh, effectively we got into cars. So if you go back to the 1960s, and even when I joined in the 1990s as a junior officer, you would never get in a car. You know, I'd be walking 10 miles a day on the beat. You had to go out and walk, quite often on your own, quite often in pairs. So you had lots of opportunity to interact with the public in a small section of London that you policed. Because that all went out the window as calls became more frantic and we had to get there quicker and everyone jumped into cars, we replaced it with a kind of home beat system, which is a very Dixon of Dot Green image. And then we replaced that with neighbourhood policing. That did not start till 2008. It's interesting that people think it's been around forever. It was only in 2008 that chief police officers agreed that neighbourhood policing was a good idea. And then they couldn't afford it, so we had to invent police community support officers to back it up. And then about five or six years later, people began to realise, oh, this is really important, just at the time that we lost 20% of our budget. So all of it went. There are parts of this country that never had neighbourhood policing teams because they were just about to be put in place and the money stopped. And in the Met, Sir Mark Rowley is promising to Quite you right, know, ring to fence neighbourhood policing. Labour, if they get in, are saying that they're going to invest in neighbourhood policing. You yeah. think that's the right way to go? Absolutely. It is the foundation of trust and confidence. And I dealt with organised crime and counter-terrorism. So every gangster I dealt with and every terrorist I dealt with lived in a street somewhere in this country. And in that street, the neighbours would know them, the church would know them, the schools would know them. And who were they going to tell? They weren't going to tell MI5 or Counterterrorism Policing or the Serious and Organised Crime Command or the National Crime Agency. They were going to tell their home beat. So it's absolutely vital as a source of intelligence as, as well as reassurance. Yes. 
as well as fostering trust and confidence. Yeah, done well. I've seen neighbourhood policing be as good as any crime squad I ever worked on. But it's on. the first thing to go, though, isn't it, when you have to make cuts and or when you, you know, when you have to respond to an incident, you have to put people on that, you have abstraction. Any chief constable knows he has to do, or she has to do two things. Answer 999 calls quickly and effectively and solve crimes that have been reported to them. Everything else is an extra. Everything else is an extra. Those two fundamental things the public expect. The third one is they expect to see us and they expect to be able to rely on us. They expect us to be able to be fair and respectful uh, and polite and professional um, and pretty much be the best of us because of the powers they have over every ordinary citizen. We've lost that image. That's why we're in crisis. In terms of crime detection and investigation, there have been a number of disturbing accounts and I've personally you know, been aware of some myself, where it just feels like police are just giving up before they've even started responding to a burglary or a robbery or a theft. Um, and then you get the standards of investigation not very good. I'm sure you've heard the stories about the, the, the person that suffered the loss has gone out and got the dash cam footage or the doorbell footage themselves or ask for CCTV footage themselves and the police just don't seem to be interested. I when did we I get to that point? I won't go into it, but I'm one of those victims. Imagine being a police officer for 30 years and you are a victim or a witness of crime and the police are not interested. Imagine how, if I hadn't been who I am, they would have walked away from that. Now, if you're an ordinary member of the public, you have no chance. Was that recent? Yes, very recently. And I, I would say this is a... Do I blame police officers today? I look at their workloads, they are immense, but actually not dissimilar from the workload I had as a young detective back in the 90s. Um, it isn't that that's crippling them, it's what we've just talked about, about social service of first resort. If 83% of the stuff you're dealing with is nothing to do with crime, when the crime comes in, particularly if it's a solvable one that you actually want to spend time on, you're not going to be able to have any time to spend on it. Is so, it really about time or, or well, is I, No, that's one problem. The second problem is experience. You've now got a whole generation of police officers who don't yet know what they're doing. By the way, we're hiring brighter, more educated, better people. The new training is better than it's ever been, and I know this firsthand. It is. It needs time to bed in. And if you're thinking that's going to be in a couple of years, it just isn't. The, the number of inexperienced police officers in the front line answering the first call, dealing with the first crime report, the young detectives, the young response officers, very inexperienced and there isn't the senior people working alongside them like when I joined you know I, I could work on a relief where there were plenty of people with 8 to 15 years experience on that relief so there was always somewhere to turn nowadays they are turning to people who are one year ahead of them or two years ahead of them that's quite frightening so that's another compound problem um, I think the third thing is and every chief officer bleats about resource but when you make cuts, you make cuts in things that are fundamental to good policing. So we cut neighbourhoods, we cut intelligence, we cut communications. All of these things were seen as kind of extras on the answering 999 calls uh, and detecting the crime that came in. We had to move towards serious threat and harm. So I'm lucky because a lot of resources and a lot of the best cops went into organised crime and counter-terrorism. So that, you know, the experience was even more drained mm. from the front line. It's a compound effect of all of these problems, you know, and a failure to understand that policing is a system. So money just gets diverted into whatever is the flavour of today. You know, it doesn't look at the whole system. You talked a lot about performance, not operations. What about culture? How you, you were in the Metropolitan Police at the time of David Carrick. He was there. You, you, you were in the Metropolitan Police when Wayne Cousins was there. I wasn't just in the Metropolitan you, Police. I was the Head of Specialist yeah. Operations. And Head of Specialist Operations, also the National League for Counterterrorism, manages around 10,000 people. So both of those two monsters worked for me, effectively. They were one of my 10,000. But you obviously didn't know them. Never I'd came never heard them. of them until they were arrested. That's not the point, though. The point is, how could they survive in policing? Exactly. How do you think, how do you think that, that happened, that all those opportunities, particularly with Carrick, were missed? So I think policing has to answer three fundamental questions. One, does it understand that policing is a profession that has the ability to attract monsters? Yes or no? 
I don't think it's probably un properly understood that the answer to that is a resounding yes. If you're going to give somebody enormous power over somebody and a uniform, and you're going to allow them the independence to work on their own, you, you could potentially have a problem. So do something about your recruitment that makes sure you don't recruit them. And you don't think policing has understood that? No, particularly not, and I'll talk about the, next, the last three years. The second thing is, is once people are in your organisation, if you have failed to spot them and they're in your organisation, how good are your systems at detecting when they start to go wrong? When their red flag behaviour, the way they act to their colleagues, the way they act to the public, you see quite a lot of it in terms of you know, excessive drinking, um, excessive womanising, you see it in um, you know, the coping mechanisms of addiction you know, because people can't cope with the job and you particularly see it in excessive use of force. When you see those things, how good is your policing system, your professionalism, your ethics, your standards at picking that up and dealing with it quickly? I would argue not very good at all. You know, it is not something policing has prioritised since 1974. Robert Mark, the last commissioner who prioritised it. Mark Rowley, the next commissioner to prioritise it. That's pretty sad. I think Paul Condon deserves great credit for what he did in anti-corruption, and I worked in that unit, but actually it was Mark who led with professional standards being the most important thing. You know, we should employ um, less criminals than we, we detect, I think is probably a great way to go forward. The third thing is, is what kind of culture have we got when we recognise those behaviours? Have we got the kind of culture in policing? Because I've worked with tens of thousands of brilliant police officers in 30 years, where they really are the best of us. And no serving chief constable can say that out loud now. They'll just sound defensive. But it is absolutely true, and the public need to understand that. But every single one of those brilliant, brilliant police officers needs to understand they have a responsibility in their culture to call out all of the bad ones long before they commit some heinous crime, but they should be calling out that lack of professional standards. Does policing have a culture that does that routinely? How can, you, how can you instill that? No. How can you instill that culture? I mean, because you, you, you know, in the Met, you've got a force of 45,000 officers and staff. Yeah. Probably easier to do in a smaller force, perhaps, where you've got 1,500 or 3,000 personnel. I think they both have their complications. You know, in a smaller force, you've got a lot of people who grew up together, a lot of people who are local, a lot of people who stayed in the same area. When I did anti-corruption, many of those forces couldn't do uh, an anti-corruption, meaning effectively catching criminals with badges. Um, I ran surveillance for two years, and a lot of other forces needed us to, in the Metropolitan Police to run their surveillance because they couldn't use their own surveillance teams because they grew up with <laughs> the people, you know, they were local, the forces were tiny, you know. so. Um, so I think people have their own problems, but you, effectively, you have to re reinforce a professional standards culture, and that comes from great leadership. We have thinned out leadership. Austerity has meant supervision ratios for, you know, sergeants and um, the first rank of police staff bandies has been massively widened. So you pretty much don't know everyone in your team, let alone what they're up to. That's a mistake. We don't train leaders. We train them for transactional purposes. So as you get to different ranks, you have different responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So we train you in the technical skill of that rank, you know, to authorise something or to be a custody sergeant. We don't teach leadership. And leadership is mm -hmm. very, very different. In you, you, did, you, you taught the strategic command course I did, for a bit. Yeah. Did you not teach leadership on that course? I thought I did it rather well. But I shouldn't be teaching chief superintendents leadership. You know, I should be teaching sergeants leadership. It is amazing the number of people who haven't been on the kind of accelerated courses that I had in my career. I spent almost a year in leadership training as a, an accelerated graduate, high potential officer. And a lot of chief constables went through that scheme. You know, there was a time when most chief constables would have come through those schemes. And they spend a lot of time developing themselves from the very first time they get stripes. You know, and that is, if you haven't been on those schemes, mm. you, can be, you can go as far as chief superintendent. You'll be lucky if you have a week's training or two weeks training as a sergeant, and maybe one or two weeks training as an inspector, largely focused on technical skills, not about you as a person, what kind of leader you are, what your ethics are, what your standards are, what your vision for policing is, how you communicate to your staff, what you think of your staff, how you inspire, how you motivate, how you manage morale. You shouldn't really be waiting 20 years to go on the strategic command course before someone is teaching you that. The hardest rank in policing by a country mile is the first one. So 
there are some, certainly some pointers there about what needs to happen. Do you have confidence that Smart Roller, who you work with very closely, and I know you've got a lot of respect for, do you think he can turn things around in, in five years? And certainly, firstly, bring them out of special measures, restore trust and confidence, root out some of the people who shouldn't be there. Do you think he can do it? If anyone can, it's Mark and Lynn, I think. I mean, I've got massive respect for two personal friends as well as professional colleagues who've been huge supporters of mine and have helped me. And I, you know I was Mark's first deputy throughout all of the terrorism of 2017. So um, I wish him the very best of luck. What he needs around him is public and political support. And he, but most, more importantly than that, he needs the support of the 45,000 police officers and staff in the Metropolitan Police. Now, if they think that they are somehow, he has a very fine balance here about keeping morale while actually telling them what's what. You know, Cress before she left, her final letter was, you know, before she stood down, was enough is enough. It was a little bit too little, a little bit too late. You know, Mark has started with a very strong professional standard stance. If I had been commissioner, I'd have done exactly the same thing as him. You have to be careful that that message doesn't start ruining the morale of your thousands of really, really great cops. That's the so risk, is it? It is the risk. It is the risk, because that discretionary effort means everything in policing. You know, people get out of bed and put their lives on the line. They don't do it for the terms and conditions. You know, 10 years of a pay freeze and a, a pension that's changed dramatically, they don't do it for that. They do it for reasons which are about all the things you want. You know, honesty, public service, compassion, bravery. They do it for all the reasons. They do it for their team, their colleagues. They need to be motivated. But as more officers are rooted out, uh, more cases are coming up to court, misconduct hearings and so on. The message is getting out there. That is the risk, isn't it? That, um, you know, morale is going to suffer? Maybe, but I mean, every single... This is a great lesson in leadership for that first young sergeant. Everybody on your first team is looking at you to solve that problem. They're not going to solve it. There's no... That whole thing about teams police themselves and they'll root out the bad people and all that kind of stuff. Nonsense. They're all looking at the leader to say something about the bad behaviour of one of their lot. And if that leader says nothing, then they will accept that person. Because in the end, it's still a living, breathing body that's going to back them up in a horrible physical confrontation where they could die. You know, effectively, that's what they want. The leader has to say something. And that is equally applicable if you're running a team of five to running a team of 50,000. And Mark has said it. He now needs his whole leadership structure from his deputy down to his sergeants to believe the same thing. And then he needs those good people that I described, who are the vast majority of police officers and staff, to start remembering that every time a Carrick or a Cousins happens, their life gets stratospherically harder. Every time they let anybody get away with unprofessional conduct, from the most minor thing to the ma most major criminal offence, their reputation is ruined. We are the only profession where the public globalises an issue. So a single individual cop is a monster. All of cops are monsters. Mm -hmm. And the profession gets, you know, and there's a bit of me that says that's fair enough because there are very few professions that have our power over you. We should be the best of the best. Mm -hmm. So those cops have got to turn those other cops in. When I was in professional standards, honestly, I mean, it wasn't invited to a leaving do for three years. You know, we were seen as the enemy. You have to have a culture which sees professional standards as worth working in for a start and worth reporting because you know it's going to save your reputation, you know it's going to make your life easier and you know it's the right thing to do because you're the best of the best. There have been some people saying that the Met is basically in the last chance saloon and that it should be broken up or reconstituted or reconfigured. I've even said I think we might need to have a conversation about that because the Met cannot keep standing outside the headquarters apologising endlessly for the latest failing, the blunder, scandal. Just can't keep happening. Is there an argument to say, actually, we need to look at the structure of, of the Met Police, hive off some of the bits that are perhaps doing well and, and let, 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 yeah. let someone come in who can, has got a complete focus on policing London? Anyone who's listening to this interview should read Michael Barber's Strategic Policing Review because I think it's brilliant. It's very long, it takes a lot of effort to read it. You should put the effort in. The only thing in it I disagree with is his attitude that somehow policing ought to be broken up 
And I think the reason I say that, and particularly, I'm not sure whether he specifically talks about the Met, but he certainly talks about counter-terrorism being taken away from the Met as a responsibility. I think that's the easiest thing for a commissioner, because I would say this, wouldn't I, I was AXO, um, you don't tend to put a weak person in charge of counter-terrorism. You don't tend to have it full of weak people. It's probably the thing that keeps you um, awake at night, but actually you can feel very reassured about. And I think most commissioners would tell you that's true. There's been a few aberrations, but mostly they would say that that's true. Their organised crime um, response is as good as anything the National Crime Agency can offer. That's a very high standard. Mostly their homicide teams are extraordinary. You know, we put a lot of effort into homicide. We solve the vast majority of them. They tend to be very high. And this is the problem about putting all your resources into specialisms. How are you going to hive all of that off so that you can concentrate on local crime and neighbourhood crime? And if you do that, if you create this kind of local policing model whereby all the specialisms go somewhere else, you are separating the policing system into a series of silos where we just talked about every major crime happens in a community. It starts in a community where people talk about it. How you then go, you'll have an American model. If you go to America and speak to the 18,700 or so jurisdictions from a two-person sheriff's county department to California Highway Patrol um, via the NYPD and ask them what they think of the FBI, you'll know what I'm talking about. So if you, if you want that separation from the specialism to local people, um, I think that's a massive mistake. It's the great strength of the model and I think the Met, what the Met requires is great leadership. It doesn't require a, a massive structural reconfiguration. We always go to structure and we forget actually this is about people doing a job who need to be well led. So invest a little bit in that before you start tearing it apart. I just want to turn uh, to a slightly different topic which is about stop and search and Crest has, has done a major report around stop and search uh, recently. You wrote a forward for it and in that you said there was you agree that there was a serious need to look at how stop and search is being used um, and it's too often used as a street su suppression tool that can make us feel that we're doing something I think is what you said. Can you explain what you mean by that because most police officers you, you speak to will say this is an absolutely valuable tactic. Because we've and told them to say that. That's a bit unfair but we have. You know, because effectively there was a point in time where it was recognised actually by Theresa May as the Home Secretary that our use of stop and search was appalling. I don't mean we were, basically, we were using it way too much, we weren't being procedurally fair, we weren't following the letter of the law, and it was having a massive disproportionate effect on community confidence, particularly on the people it was mostly targeting. So most stop and search, if a Chief Constable is intelligent, he or she will be putting their stop and search into high crime areas. High crime areas tends to mean high poverty areas. You look at lower super output areas. They'll marry the two together. Why are those high crime areas? Normally because unemployment, poverty, crime, addiction, all of these things are in those areas. Those areas are quite often populated either by disenfranchised working class. Quite often in the northeast you'll find that's white working class deindustrialized communities. They don't have a lot of confidence in policing because they are feel continually picked on. And in major urban cities, the concentrations are people of colour. So you are naturally putting your police officers in a place where you are coming into conflict with people that you have very little cultural competence of dealing with because there are so few black and brown police officers. So you are immediately putting yourself in a situation where if you're not brilliant at that tactic in the way you use it, you are going to create more community tension and more conflict. Mm -hmm. And my argument is, we're not great at using it. So just get better at using it? Better training? Is that the answer? Or Well, I, I or actually think part approach? of the problem is Chief Constables think, oh, don't worry, as long as I teach them Go Wisely, the acronym that will teach them each part of the law, and they're able to communicate Go Wisely to the person they're searching, we've done our job. That is, of course, nonsense. The major thing that police officers need, and by the way, we need them to demonstrate this when we recruit them, we shouldn't be teaching them when they're doing stop and search, is their ability to communicate with another human being. The most important piece of personal protective equipment a police officer ever has is their communication skills and their voice. And if they can't talk to people, prince or pauper, regardless of their background, regardless of their colour, their gender, their identity, their sexuality, their religion, if they can't talk to people, we shouldn't be recruiting them in the first place. 
If they had those skills, they might be able to better deploy Go Wisely in a way that led to less conflict. But I do think chiefs are addicted to the idea that stop and search is solving a problem. Backed up by politicians with very hardline criminal deterrence views that think that that is a great way to resolve crime. I have seen no professional evidence to say that stop and search is an effective crime tool. I'm probably one of the most experienced police officers in the country of dealing with serious violence. Gangsters, terrorists, stop and search, never one of my tactics. When you were at Operation Trident, were you, you headed Operation Trident, which was to tackle... I didn't head Operation Trident, I was one of its senior investigating officers. Senior investigating They're officers. They're in the news a lot at the moment, so I know exactly what that kind of pressure is like. But I was a murder squad senior investigating officer for Trident, working with the black community, trying to solve problems of drug-related killings within the black community. And stop and search wasn't a, a, a tactic that you felt was helpful? That's not the tactic that was stopping people killing other people. What were the tactics? The tactics were getting community confidence so they would report um, intelligence to you about the gangsters who were carrying weapons, where they were hiding them, when they were meeting, who they were meeting, why people were being killed, and in my case, investigating murders after the event. We weren't preventing the murder, but mm. we were preventing subsequent murders by people actually giving evidence against the perpetrators. But you have to you have something on the streets though, don't you? You have, well, to have a, you have to have a presence on the streets, I mean communities. I, I'm, not arguing, against, to, I'm yeah. not arguing against that, and actually yeah. a lot of the black community don't argue against that either. And that yeah. has also been used as an excuse to keep increasing stop and search, is that, and particularly they will use bereaved families. Now, that bereaved families are not good policy tools. Because if I lose my son to knife crime, I'm going to want you to do. Every, I'm going to want you to turn over everybody on the street all of the time. Of course I am, you know, and that is what I'm going to say. And I'm going to back your very aggressive stop and search tool. Now I'm not saying for one second that stop and search cannot be very effective if it's deployed surgically in the right place at the right time, and most importantly, done by cops who understand how to speak to the communities they're using it on. The point I'm saying is there is a disproportionate. Um, level of stop and search which isn't being effective and all it is doing is driving community tension up and driving community cooperation down and it's in the very communities that I used to deal with when I was in Trident the black Afro-Caribbean community if you look at the statistics about how many of them are victims how many of them are victims as well as perpetrators that is the community you want to help you so what you don't do is brutally target that community with a street suppression tool that you know is not working because the knife crimes and the shootings are still, are still going up. And but if, you, but if you were at the Met at a time when they used to put out um, tweets or press releases saying we've just seized these knives and have photos of zombie knives that have been seized through a stop and search. You, 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 you were at the Met at that time when, when that, when that yeah. was something that they and did. I supported those policies. And, and, and the statistics would come out, we've seized this many knives this month through stop and search, it works. Well, the vast majority of those would have been through street sweeps, so they would have been taken out of where they'd been hidden by kids. Yeah, know, but there have been other examples where they've said, we found this, this number of weapons through, through stops. So, there's been lots of people who've tried to prove that stop and search has had a, you know, a major effect on reducing crime. I've not seen one who said that it has. And I, you know, I, but a weapon off the street means, we're, we're means that's not going to be used, isn't no, it? No, that's fantastic. But that is not an excuse for making stop and search your principal tool. And if you use it in a way that is actually decreasing confidence and decreasing intelligence, then long term you're shooting yourself in the foot. You need the intelligence from that community. So, and I'm not saying that that community is going to say you shouldn't use stop. In fact, I've never heard anyone in either a white working class community or the black Afro-Caribbean community or any community that um, says that stop and search should be outlawed. It should always be a tool available to policing, used well in the right circumstances at the right time. But it is but one tool. And if it is affecting community confidence and therefore intelligence and cooperation and witnesses, then you've got a problem. And I would say today, that is a major problem. Now, a related topic uh, concerns the Police Race Action Plan, which has been developed by the National Police Chiefs Council and the College of Policing. I think it's still in draft form. This is a, um, a major plan to improve confidence and trust among black and minority ethnic communities in particular. And you have said 
that the Achilles heel of this is the inability to galvanise all chief constables to accept that we remain institutionally racist and to apologise for that, we are guilty as charged, the police service. Do you mean all police forces institutionally racist? Yeah, I think this is policing as a profession. I really resented as a young sergeant in 1999, chief constable saying, well, this is a London problem. It's the Metropolitan Police problem. I've had something very similar recently. Somebody told me that a chief constable has said, um, I, don't know, uh, I don't know what all the fuss is about. We don't have many of them here. I mean, I haven't heard anything like that since the 1980s. That's a chief constable in 2022 saying that. There's a chief constable... Which who, one? I, I, I'm obviously not going to say that. Um, there's another chief constable who was threatened with a sack by their police crime commissioner if they came out and called their force institutionally racist. So in, in, some, in, in the discussions around the police yeah. race action plan? So there's some fear out there. Um, I spoke to chief constable's council in December 2021. Uh, December the 16th. It was virtual. I was running the strategic command course at the time. Uh, and I said it was time to acknowledge the fact that we remained institutionally racist, that we ought to apologise for it, and the time was right to launch the action plan on the basis of that acknowledgement and apology. You can't expect people to trust you if you can't acknowledge you've got a problem and say it out loud. Um, I thought I'd won the room on the day. I was told by a couple of very senior chiefs that I had um, that was not true. The room had actually moved against me, and actually most chief constables did not want to say that we were institutionally racist. Uh, at least a third of chief constables probably don't think we are institutionally anything. Um, they don't see the problem at all. Probably another third are terrified of reducing morale by our front line being seen as... They will have the same corporate memory from 1999 when William McPherson launched the report. Paul Condon really scared of the fact that no police officer would hear the word institutional, they would just hear racism and think they were all being called racist. I experienced a lot of that. I think Paul Condon was right. You know, we didn't communicate it well. The inquiry, the inquiry tried to finesse the, mm. um, the definition to make sure that police officers didn't feel they were all being called individually racist. <clears throat> it didn't really work. I think, A, we're more sophisticated now. We could have had a more sophisticated communication strategy. And our workforce, particularly our young workforce, gets this. It gets diversity, equality and inclusion in a way that we didn't 30 years ago. You know. And I think that, so there is a problem, I think, with chiefs being too scared to do something because of a, something that happened 20 years ago. So how many and, chiefs and, do you think are actually too scared? You said in that room, that know, meeting, I think, I think, it's about I a think, third? I think there's a third of us who worked on the race action plan. Some of us who talked out loud publicly about this. Dave Thompson, West Midlands, and he was chairing the race action plan. Um, Lucy Dorsey said some great stuff as British Transport Chief Constable, my old deputy, um, when I was in counter-terrorism. I've said some stuff. Some other chiefs have come out and bravely and publicly acknowledged. Gary Forsyth at Bedfordshire did the same thing. Um, and I think about a third of National Police Chiefs Council, at one point or another, were working or assisting on the race action plan. A third are terrified, <laughs> and a third don't care. And I... I, so this is this will be a sort of brutal comment. Part of the reason I retired, there are lots of reasons I retired when I did, but part of it is I don't trust this generation of chief constables to do anything about institutional racism. And when, post George Floyd, when I made the comments I did, I had an awful lot of black and brown staff from all over the country, not just the Metropolitan Police, talking to me because they forget I'm an assistant commissioner very quickly because I'm brown. So they see me as, you know, as a mixed race police officer, not as a boss. They don't tell their own bosses this, but they tell them how they feel, how they're treated. And then communities tell us that. Communities have been really clear. You're institutionally racist. They've made that judgment. So that's two, form, that's two data points. Then you look at all the disproportionality in your stop and search. That's another data point. You look at all your data uh, of use of force and the disproportionality in that. Another data point. And you look at all the disproportionality in the way you recruit, retain and promote people of colour and female officers for that matter, uh, and you look at the disproportionality in the way you treat them when they put in a grievance or when they are under investigation. All of that is as true today as it was in 1999. In 2009, when the Home Affairs Select Committee looked at it and congratulated policing on all the work it had done post McPherson, um, it looked exactly the same, and they hadn't met any of the targets that were set. Uh, at the next anniversary, 2019, exactly the same thing. And by the way, in 2012, I did an internal report 
for the Met called the Diversity Health Check of the Met. I did it for Sir Craig Mackey. None of the data had changed. And in 2022, none of the data has changed. We're approaching, in 2023, the 30-year anniversary of Stephen's murder. Lots of things in society have changed. Lots of things in policing has changed. But those fundamental, iconic disproportionality figures have not changed at all. And you don't, certainly don't think that, this, that, that, that the, the senior leadership in, in the police service at the moment is going to acknowledge institutional racism, and for that reason it's hard to, to make the progress that no, you think I is mean, necessary. The, the and, and, and what about the Home Office? Do you think that they're pushing people in that direction or not? Absolutely not. And what a paradox for the Home Office, because it wants us to be um, closer to the communities we serve, it wants us to represent the communities we serve, but it's not willing to do anything about achieving that. And it's not willing to hold chief constables to account. So one of the other reasons is, having asked a key question about why are HMIC FRS not including the race action plan in its peel inspections of chief constables? It doesn't have any teeth, HMIC FRS, despite all of the what you hear about engagement and special measures. But no chief constable likes a poor inspection. You know, it immediately puts them on the radar of their community and their police crime commissioners and the their fellow chief constables. No one likes it. So it would be a really good way to hold you to account if you've signed up to this race action plan and you've signed up to everything except institutional racism. You, you don't agree with institutional racism, but you've spent two years developing an action plan to deal with it. Just think about the logic of that statement for one second. We don't agree with institutional racism, but we better spend two years formulating an action plan to get rid of it. I think that's very strange. I was, I was on the race action plan board. I could not get these arguments through. Um, other people couldn't get these arguments through. But look for the right outcome. You're going to do all of the actions, aren't you? Well, are you? Because the Home Secretary doesn't care. HMIC FRS. She doesn't, to be clear, she doesn't care about... She doesn't care about this. She doesn't care about the race action plan. I doubt she's even seen it. I don't think the previous Home Secretary cared about the race action plan. They've not asked HMIC FRS to inspect on it. HMIC are doing, as I understand it, four separate thematic inspections on race. Well, one of them was completed at least two years ago, to my knowledge. You've never seen or heard of it, have you? You follow policing very closely, you follow what's put out there. I've not heard of it. I happen to know it was finished. I was interviewed for it. One of the six times I've been interviewed about race and policing in my 30-year career, two of them in front of parliamentary or mayoral committees. Mm. Nothing has changed. You know, in the iconic, what's changed is our ability to investigate our family liaison, our emergency life support. We changed some amazing things about technically how we do deliver policing. Hate crime, what a fantastic change that was. All thanks to my great hero and mentor, Professor John Grieve. The way we deal with hate crime today is world leading. And yet I hear lots of commentary about the fact that we waste our time dealing with hate crime. Only someone who's never been a victim daily, like me, of hate crime, would be able to say that out loud, um, which I find amazing. But it's one of the great legacies of Stephen's murder and his parents' amazing campaign and William McPherson's crucial report, that we do those things well. But all the iconic stuff that people are looking at, they remain exactly where they were all that time ago. I'll leave you with one statistic. When I joined the Metropolitan Police, less than 1% of the Metropolitan Police was of colour. 22% of London was non-white. When I left the Metropolitan Police, 16% of policing was of colour. That sounds like huge improvement. Of the Met? Of the Met. Yeah. I was in the Met. The Met. Uh, of which London, in the 2011 census, the non-white statistic, the one up mm. until the 2011 mm. census was 44% non-white, it's increased. So look at the gap. It's getting wider, not closer. Yeah. Barber himself says 58 years before you represent the London community you serve on your current... So posi positive discrimination, is that, is that the answer to it? I argued for it. Um, do you still argue for it? The paper said I was slapped down in National Policing Board. I wasn't slapped down do at you, all. Do you still think that that's the, the way to try and marry that it, gap? I, I think it's the only thing that will work because the number of applications into policing, if you don't have positive discrimination, even if you start attracting more people to join, and how difficult is that if you're not acknowledging you've had a problem? If you attract more people to join, you get more applicants. They are massively outweighed by the number of um, white, uh, uh, middle class, undergraduate applicants. If you do it on an equal weighting basis, 
they're always going to crowd out black and brown voices unless you actually do something to increase the possibility of getting them through. That is not about lowering standards. That's about recognising you've yeah. got a problem in that area, just like Pierce and I did in the post-pattern years when it tried to increase the number of Catholics within uh, the PSNI. That piece of very time-limited legislative change to allow positive discrimination was important. And I don't agree with positive discrimination normally. I didn't want it 30 years ago. I wanted people to think I was a great cop. I didn't want anyone to give me a leg up for any reason other than I was a great cop. Uh, and everybody I know with a protected characteristic, whether they're female, gay, black, brown, all feel exactly the same way. We do not want positive discrimination. My point to the government who are setting policy is you will never have a representative police service without it. Now, finally, um, I just want to ask about the future for you. Do you see yourself at some point coming back into policing? You, you know, you left... You went for the National Crime Agency job, you didn't get it, but I mean, were you given an explanation from the Home Office as to why you didn't get it? I think you sought one, didn't you? I've had conversations with the Home Office, which what, is what, all so, I'm prepared what, to say. Right, um, they haven't a, told you. Uh, there was a very good article in the Sunday Times about why I didn't get it. I and what did that people, say? I will leave people to read it. Right. Um, so is the door still open for policing for you at some point? Not under the current administration, quite clearly. I would, I would suggest. So I think my comments on institutional racism, uh, friends of the government calling me the super woke so-called head of counter-terrorism, being called woke continually by certain right-wing sections of the press, I'm not flavour of the month with this current administration. It's quite funny because I've always, and I said it on Channel 4, you know, I said it to Cathy, you know, woke for me is the Oxford English de de Dictionary definition. You know, you. Do you either, you're alert to and you believe in racial and social justice or you don't? That is what I mean by woke. I think it's a terrible, crying shame that something that was such a bastion of civil rights activism has been so perverted by both the extreme left and the extreme right that we've now devalued the concept entirely. But unfortunately that has become my nickname. Um, I'm actually proud of it because I think it's about believing in racial and social justice. Mm. I believe in a much wider mission for policing than perhaps the current administration does. So I don't think as a Chief Constable I would be um, given that opportunity or that chance. And I've been headhunted for plenty of Chief Constable jobs, so there are PCCs out there who might see that differently. I happen to think it's not about politics. You know, it's never been policing. Policing's all about politics and nothing to do with politics. You know this argument very mm -hmm. well. Um, good policing doesn't have to be, um, you know, Labour or Conservative. It is about understanding what causes crime and understanding how best to defeat it. And that is a much wider debate than the one we always have, which is arrest more people and lock them up for longer uh, and stop messing around with the causes of crime because that's nothing to mm. do with you, Mr Bassett. That's nonsense. That's just a, a poor interpretation of what policing is about. National Crime Agency, different. I was the head of counterterrorism. I'm a detective. The two greatest detective jobs in law enforcement have got to be the head of counterterrorism and the head of the National Crime Agency. I was gutted I didn't get that job. I am a career detective. That is the one job that I would have wanted in law enforcement, which is why it was the one job I applied for. Uh, and I was very upset I didn't get it, and I'll leave it at that. But perhaps if a vacancy comes in the future, you get another shot at it. Maybe. Neil Bassey, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you. Thanks, Danny.